If this is your land, where are your stories? If these are your news, where are your views? With the headlines and hashtags this week, I am Sisanda Alutambolekwa. Join us on the People's Perspective and let the hashtag be heard. Here are your top stories in South African news this week. Cabinet calls for action against corruption in government and Gauteng officials to face lifestyle audits. With the headlines and hashtags, I am Sisanda Alutambolekwa. Thank you for joining us. Cabinet has called on all public institutions to uphold the highest standards of integrity and accountability. Briefing the media in Pretoria on Cabinet's recent meeting, Justice and Correctional Services Minister Ronald Lamula says it has called on those institutions to fulfill their mandates effectively and efficiently. The meeting has also raised concerns regarding allegations of corruption affecting COVID-19 relief processes. Lamula says government is committed to dealing with corruption. Cabinet remains committed to building a capable, ethical and developmental state. It supports the recent call by President Cyril Ramaphosa for law enforcement agencies to do whatever they can to arrest those involved in corruption, irrespective of who they are, ensure they recover the looted funds. Last week, President Cyril Ramaphosa signed a proclamation for the Special Investigating Unit uh, to investigate allegations relating to the misuse of COVID-19 relief funds. He also announced the formation of a ministerial committee to investigate allegations of corruption related to the procurement of personal protective equipment, also known as PPE. The committee will also look at ways in which law enforcement agencies can be supported to ensure that they have resources to fight corruption. Johannesburg remains the uh, epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in Gauteng. But Gauteng Premier David Makura is also trying to flatten another equally urgent curve, the corruption associated with the procurement of personal protective equipment in the province. The Premier has announced that two health officials are being investigated by the Special Investigation Unit and uh, that the provincial cabinet will be subjected to lifestyle audits. Damning allegations of corruption regarding the procurement of PPE in Gauteng province have profoundly eroded public confidence in the collective work of our provincial government uh, in, and in the work we have done so well in, in a sustained period in the fight against COVID-19. I didn't mean any word uh, about this, that this has undermined, severely eroded uh, the standing of our provincial government. The State Security Agency will be conducting lifestyle audits on the Premier and all his provincial MECs. He says this is part of fighting corruption and ensuring that no official is living beyond their means. The audits are expected to be concluded in six to eight weeks. The South African Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation has offered the country's help in the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Zimbabwe. There were a number of abductions and arrests of civic society activists and opposition politicians in Zimbabwe before the July 31st demonstrations against President Emerson Mnangagwa's rule. Sidney Mufamadi and Bale Gambete have been named as special envoys to Zimbabwe as the South African government attempts to intervene in an unfolding crisis. In a statement, President Cyril Ramaphosa said the pair would be expected to engage the government of Zimbabwe and relevant stakeholders to identify possible ways in which South Africa can assist Zimbabwe. Mufamadi is a former cabinet member having served in various roles between 1994 to 2008, while Mbete is a former deputy president and a former speaker of the National Assembly. The president's special envoys will leave for Zimbabwe as soon as all the arrangements have been made. That's it from us for news on the continent. Uh, we will be monitoring the story quite closely. And in the meantime, can we all uh, hashtag pray for Zimbabwe? 
we are now going to head over to our sports reporter Dylan Bettencourt who's going to give us a roundup of the week in the world of sports. Uh, over to you Dylan. In football news, Arsenal merged victorious in the FA Cup final against London rivals Chelsea. A double for Gabon international Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang secured the Ghana's boss Mikel Arteta's first trophy as manager. European football resumed this week with mid-week Europa League games. Manchester United and Wolves both securing their spots in the quarter finals of the competition. Local football makes its comeback this weekend with Nedbank Cup semi-final action on Saturday the 8th of August. Morocco FC will be taken on Bloemfontein Celtic. The other semi-final will see two giants clashing as Bidvest Vitz take on Mamelodi Sundowns. PSL action returns next week, kicking off with two massive fixtures as Mamelodi Sundowns take on Orlando Pirates and Kaiser Chiefs face Bidvest Vitz. This week Friday also sees Champions League return with Real Madrid hoping to overcome their 2-1 deficits against Manchester City. Cristiano Ronaldo and his Juventus side will also look to avenge their 1-0 defeat to French side Lyon to progress to the quarter-finals of this competition. In Saturday's Champions League action, Bayern Munich host Chelsea and go into the counter with a 3-0 margin. Lionel Messi's Barcelona will look to gain an advantage over Napoli with the tie all squared in an attempt to improve on a less than impressive season for the team from Spain. In basketball news, the NBA has returned with all action taking place in Orlando, Florida at Disney World or the bubble as it has been called. Teams will play a host of matches before the postseason finals begin on September 30th, 2020. In Formula 1 news, Lewis Hamilton claimed first place in his home Grand Prix in what proved to be a chaotic final lap at Silverstone, with his teammate Valtteri Bottas dropping 10 places on the last lap. Max Verstappen and Charles Leclerc made up the final two podium places. Teams will look forward to doing all over again this weekend at Silverstone with the race happening on Sunday the 9th of August at 10 past 3 South African Standard Time. I'll be back next week with more sports news. Back to you, Sisanda. Up next is a roundup of the week in the entertainment news. Riabe Baloi, our entertainment news reporter, has more. Thank you, Sisanda. And in our local news this week, our own financial fitness bunny, Nicolette Mashile, has released her book titled, What's Your Move? Nicolette Mashile, who is also a daily Teta presenter and a YouTuber that gives us financial coaching content, has released her book titled, What's Your Move? on the 1st of August. She says that the book is all about her personal experiences with money and says that it is a challenge that challenges us to make financial moves in our lives. From us, we would like to say to Nicolette Mashile, congratulations and well done on the release of your book. Our own media personality, Bonang Mateba, has also released her own documentary titled A Very Bonang Year. Bonang Mateba's documentary is all about her transition from being just a media personality to being re recognized globally and as well as being an entrepreneur. It has been recorded that over 1.8 million views have been viewed on SABC1 and also has set a record on the SABC1 channel. From us, we would like to say to Bonang, congratulations and well done. On more international news, Beyonce has released her film titled Black is King. Black is King is all about black lives and has been taken from the movie The Lion King and the album The Gift. We have seen some of South Africa's local creators being casted on Black is King, the likes of Nandi Madita, Waran Masemola and the legendary late Mama Mary Twala. Ms. Tina Knowles and Beyonce have sent their condolences during the course of the week on the passing of Mama Mary Twala and Sumizi has responded by saying thank you for showing love and respect to my mother. From me, Riyabe Zubaloi, that is all I have for you this week. Back to you, Sisanda. And now for the final segment of our show, let the hashtag be heard. On this week's segment of uh, let the hashtag be heard, we are unpacking the higher education a system and its near collapse due to online learning brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. As a former student leader, it is devastating to see the sector deteriorate in the way in which it has. We know that there have always been inequalities that have existed in the sector, but we can only now imagine how this has all been exacerbated by this pandemic. It cannot be that we are in the eighth month of the year where some universities such as WITS, UP, uh, UCT are all well within their second semester but you still have students running behind hashtags, begging for leadership in the sector to save their academic year. We are now joined by Utabo Shingange, who's a student activist, former president of UPSRC, and is currently serving as spokesperson of the South African Union of Students. Utabo also sits in the higher education task team 
whose mandate is to figure out to se the sector's response to COVID-19. Tabo, thank you so much for your time. Good morning, Sasanda, and to your viewers. Thank you very much uh, for having us. So, Tabo, today we are unpacking the hashtag that we've seen on social media, which is hashtag save the UFH academic year that has been rallied by students on social media. On the other end, we are seeing some students writing exams and going into the second semester, while some have barely even touched classes this year. What exactly is taking place? Give us an idea of what is happening in the sector. Why are some students in class while virtually and some aren't? Thanks, thanks, Asanda. I think uh, you, you start off correctly by laying out some of the challenges in the higher education space, what we term as SAWS as the development of a two-tier higher education system, which is characterized by your most advanced historically white uh, and elite institutions, the likes, like you mentioned, of your VITS, your UCT, your Stellenbosch, your UFS, and so forth, continuing almost seamlessly and aimlessly online, relying, of course, on their institutional resources, their vast, rich resources, uh, at the expense of your most historically disadvantaged institutions. You are mentioning a hashtag, for instance, save UFH academic year. What we've seen, for instance, over the last uh, two, three months or so, is various hashtags. Uh, even before save uh, UFH academic year, you are seeing, for instance, hashtag UFH must fall, hashtag uh, Unizulu must fall, hashtag Univen must fall. But if you look at it systemically, basically we are saying hashtag all your historically disadvantaged universities must fall. And that speaks to what we're saying when they, that, that there are broader challenges that are, that are exacerbating the existing inequality because these institutions by and large are failing to catch up uh, with the online trends, which if we recall correctly, uh, uh, Sasanda, is that the trend to put, or the, rather the push online does not come necessarily from the sector as a response. Instead, what has been happening is that you'd recall it was the like of bits, the likes of UJ, which initially made the advance of the 30 gigs of data, the advance of the particular laptops in trying to respond to some of the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic. And by implication, set trends uh, that will therefore be assumed as a standard position of higher education. So what we're seeing is the most advanced are continuing with their resources at the expense of disadvantaged institutions and of course um, students, which by and large majority of them come from your poor rural backgrounds. Uh, in, in, in your rural communities and your townships and so forth. Sure. Now, Tabo, as someone who's been engaging in the higher education task team since its inception and formation, what are some of the deliberations that have been made thus far? Look, uh, I think that the, the issue of the task team needs to, to, to be approached with caution, with, with caution, rather, because what was set up was a PSET COVID-19 response task team which, and in the terms of reference, is to advise the minister on, on some of the uh, sector response uh, in terms of dealing with the pandemic. It is comprised merely of stakeholders, so the likes of universities, South Africa, uh, South, uh, labor unions, worker unions, and so forth, to deliberate. It's chaired by the deputy minister, uh, uh, Minister Putimanamela. However, the task team itself has failed to convene its weekly meetings over the last two months. Uh, we have not set a single meeting in the last two months, which has therefore stifled the platform discussions and almost, you know, rendered it useless. And therefore, what we're seeing is universities operating in adverse silos uh, at the expense of any meaningful collaboration. And in fact, what we're seeing uh, rather is that in the absence of this particular ministerial trust in convening its meetings, therefore, the department has, has therefore either let go entirely of its obligation to account to some of these particular challenges. And so we're, we're found with complexities where we're raising issues in these task teams, which are not necessarily being responded to. And, and then as a result, you have the task team itself almost rendered useless. Sure. Uh, it's very, very horrific scenes that you're describing there, that there, have been, there has been a, a, a response put in place uh, to, to form a, a, a task team. It is very horrific to hear that it has not set in, in such a long time, which does leave the students uh, wanting um, uh, some form of leadership from the sector at this point. Um, it's interesting that you mention a lack of a coordinated system across the sector, uh, but in reality, what does this mean from stu for students who are both from historically advantaged and historically disadvantaged universities? What does this look like for them? What is their reality currently because of the lack of leadership in the sector? Look. I think that the issue of higher education in South Africa needs to be approached from a very historical to understand that, for instance, the reason we speak of 
historical and perhaps country advantage institutions is because of the vast government resources that have been pumped into those particular uh, resources and the patterns and trends historically. However, what we're saying is that the issue around or a response to a global pandemic uh, such as COVID-19 uh, should be a response that takes into consideration our local social socioeconomic realities and inequalities that exist not only in society at large but in our universities which mimic these universe uh, which mimic rural society as my cosms of university so what we're seeing is that universities are continuing with almost like a competitive edge you know uh, you, with, with slogans like give a uh, visit the edge or fly edge, or whatever the case might be um whereas these other institutions are being left behind and there's a broader implication to not really touching on for instance even next Still, in the years to come, even employment prospects, for instance, when we begin to look at qualifications, these very same students from these very same disadvantaged institutions will also be further complicated or further hindered in the process whereby firms or whatever companies or whatever employment opportunities may arise prefer these particular institutions, your most historically white advantaged institutions. And therefore, we are perpetuating those institutional inequalities by virtue of this uh, lack of coordinated response, which foremost the issue of our, of our higher education transformation at the forefront uh, of our discussions and then perhaps we can speak about other forms of alternative engagement and continuing the academic year online the two can coexist to save the academic year but not exacerbate the current existing inequalities while online edition might be perhaps a, a future solution for this country it is not an immediate solution given the vast uh, ineffective coordination of the sector and also the, the, the various challenges faced by disadvantaged institutions the corruption, the maladministration. I mean, it's 26 years into democracy. We need to also begin to hold those particular elements uh, of failure accountable. Sure, Tabo. Uh, had it been a normal state of affairs, you would have seen some form of response from students and student leaders on campuses uh, in forms of mobilization and, and, and wanting their voices to be heard. How has this current state of affairs hampered student activism and its ability to mobilize? in defense of students? Look, uh, I, I, I like how you, you, you come with this approach of the inability to mobilize for students. And I think that's exactly what has happened as a result of this particular pandemic, whereby right, right below in a normal setup, if these were the existing challenges, you would see, for instance, nationwide protests, almost the equivalent of, of this fall uh, 2015 protest. Instead, conversely, what we're seeing is that the very same inequalities that were being fought about in 2015 Peace Fall are rearing their ugly head again. But this time around, students are demobilized. Students are in remote areas with no laptops, no data, data network infrastructure issues and so forth. And therefore, their voices are not being heard within the particular sector, which is what is worrisome and it's what is entrenching perhaps a two-tier system because no one is being held accountable. No platform of meaningful engagement is being provided to students with the ability for those particular students to access these particular engagements. And so what you're seeing is on your social medias, for instance, your various hashtags, your various insults, even towards us as student activists, which I understand because it's coming from the frustrations of the failure of the system to respond positively and to protect uh, the, the, the free education that was hardly fought for. Uh, I mean, many people have uh, criminal records, many people went to prison, many people suffered traumas for this particular free education, so we must be able to guard Jealously, those particular gains. However, the response that has been given as a sector gives little to inspire towards a full realization of the quality of this particular free education that we thought about. All right, my, my last question to you, Tabo, is where to from now? What is South's what is South's plan to save or salvage uh, the academic year uh, and engagements with, with the minister and the sector as a whole? Uh, is, is, is there no hope for students? What, what, what are we seeing from your side? What, what is SARS planning uh, uh, in terms of uh, saving um, the academic career of many, many students who are in dire need of your intervention at this point? Look, Susanna, the question about what is SARS doing cannot be spoken about in broader isolation to the challenges that I raised, for instance. Because SARS, for you know, is made up of students in and of themselves. Uh, we are all re uh, registered at a particular university. So the, the challenges that those students are facing, challenges that we are facing as well in terms of mobilizing and so forth. But however, we are using the various platforms. This platform alone is but one of the, of the platforms we are using to raise uh, awareness, to raise 
public concern uh, in the broader interest of these particular students, hoping that it will yield some kind of positive uh, result. We have as well written to the minister uh, outlining our concerns, not only as a union, but within the broader uh, uh, issues of, or challenges across the sector. What we're hoping perhaps that could be done is that these particular institutions that have even started the second semester, they must, you know, they, they needs to be a slowdown in terms of them rushing to call the academic uh, year in 2020, while we try and look at ways in which we align these particular institutions which have been left behind. Perhaps even a more, a more progressive solution would be that even these institutions with, with your vast resources must be able to adopt an institution with, with historically disadvantaged uh, challenges nearby and begin to facilitate some kind of process so that the sector then is yielding towards a single coordinated system, understanding that we should not be operating as islands, as 26 different islands in the form of public universities, but towards the broader transformation and vision as of the Higher Education Act in terms of driving education, which is very, it's a very political question of education in this country, particularly as it pertains to black people. When you look at the things of the, the Bantu education and you look at the things that, of the University Act, Extension of Universities Act and so forth. So we cannot continue post-apartheid, post-democratic South Africa to have a higher education and a basic education in crisis. It does not do well to, in terms of driving youth development forward and it doesn't do well in terms of shaping the ideals of this country moving forward. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Tabo, for your time. Very powerful uh, insights given there in terms of what is currently happening in the current uh, higher education sector and what the proposed solutions would be to the issue. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Tabo Shingang, a student activist and former president of UPSRC, who's also currently serving as spokesperson of the South African Union of Students. Tabo, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And to the viewers, thank you very much for tuning in. That's it from us uh, here at The People's Perspective. We are going to keep making sure that your hashtags are being heard. Uh, thank you for tuning in and see you next time.